our webinar today is DDH. It's best practice, best practice guidelines. I hope you have a good day and you have a very good cases today with our speakers and our panel. So I hand the microphone to our moderator, Professor Nabil, Nabil uh, Ghali, to start our webinar. Professor Nabil. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you, my uh, chairman, Professor Amr Khairi, uh, for uh, me. It is an honor to be with you tonight. And this is this third webinar of our orthopedic department in Shams University. Uh, presented by our pediatric orthopedic unit. We will discuss an important subject which has a great challenge in decision making, which is developmental dysplasia of the hip. First of all, me, I am Nabil Abmanam Ghali. First of all, I would like to uh, welcome my six professors and the uh, guest panel of this uh, webinar, uh, Professor Ali Ibrahim. Professor Hani Hefni and my dear colleague Professor Tari Hassan. Also, we must invite. I welcome my colleagues uh, who are the, will be the speakers tonight: Dr. Tamer Fayad, Dr. Shadi Samir, and Dr. Ahmed Said. Our webinar tonight will divided into five parts. Each part will uh, involve or contain an important title or uh, er, uh, according to the age of presentation of the child presented with developmental dysplasia of the hip. Let us to start with part one, with the early detection. Is, we are uh, speaking about the screening versus surveillance. We present two clinical scenario at age of birth. The clinical scenario with a female 24 years old prime gravida, develop, deliver full term baby girl with elective cesarean section because the boy baby was in breech position. You are called by the attending pediatric physician as he uh, noticed that the baby has clicky left hip on the routine exam examination of the newborn. This is one of our first clinical scenario. There are another clinical scenario with a female lady, 32 years old, delivers sir, her third baby, who was full term, delivered by normal vaginal delivery. Again, you are called by the pediatric physician who attending this labor, as he noticed the baby has leaky right hip. So we has we have two, two different uh, clinical scenarios. And one of them, as I mentioned, and I start with asking our Professor Rahim about his opinion, how he will deal with both cases. We start with the first one in front of you, Professor Ali. Yes. Uh, actually, these two are very clear cases. Uh, I would like to mention first that clicking hip is not a diagnosis of DDH. There are some differential diagnoses. Most commonly is iliotibial uh, tract snapping or iliosoas uh, snapping or uh, associated multiple congenital deformities. Uh, so in this case, we have to be clinically sure about DDH diagnosis. The first case is a newborn breach presentation female with a click on the left hip, and it is the first baby for that mother. All these are risk factors for DDH, especially if associated with club food. So we have to clinically prove if it is unstable hip or not. This we can do by performing ortolani test and, uh, and Barlow's test. With this, we can uh, find out unstable hip. We can be sure about this by performing an ultrasound examination. Ultrasound examination, although some authors prefer to do immediately after birth, myself, I prefer to do after six weeks because in the differential diagnosis, we have to put a normal hip, which gives a click 
without being unstable here. Thanks. This is the first case, Professor Ali. What about in comparison with the second one? The second case, the second case does not have risk factors because it is a boy, it is the right hip, and it is the third baby for that mother. So because there is a clicking hip, we have to be uh, performing other clinical examination, including Barlow's test and Ortolani test. And in this case, we can do ultrasound at birth or delay it for six weeks. And myself, I prefer to do X-ray to examine the spine to exclude meningomyelocele and paralytic hip and other causes of clicking hip. Thank this you. case, Professor, second case, is, is, has, has an isolated problem. The other parts, examination part, are normal. Do you notice that the first one, there is a risk factors, as you said, and second yes. one, there is no risk factors. And yes. you will proceed for doing ultrasound. Yes. For both? Especially for, for, cases? Yes. especially for the second case, especially for the second case, because for the first case, there is risk factor and we can be, uh, perform a clinical examination to be sure about instability of the hip, which can be normal and uh, will disappear at six weeks. Okay. So we, I prefer myself to do for the first baby ultrasound after six weeks. Okay. And if I do it immediately, I have to repeat it at six weeks. This is your opinion, Professor Ali. I can yeah. shift okay. my mic to Professor Haney uh, to tell us about his experience in these two cases. What is your protocol of uh, uh, proceeding for diagnosis and treating Professor Haney for these cases? Uh, thank you for inviting me, uh, Professor Nabil and Professor Ham. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Yeah. Welcome, as usual. Uh, <clears throat> I think, as uh, Professor Ali said, uh, the case with the primary gravida has a lot of uh, question marks. So she needs to be properly examined. And if, uh, if we have any doubts, we can do ultrasound either before she leaves the hospital, but there is no way to pass the four weeks mark without having a proper ultrasound and document whatever is there. Uh, if she is positive, or we click, uh, I mean, if the baby is query uh, dislocatable, I would put the baby in double nappies for the, the time being until we do the proper ultrasound at the proper time, which is could be either before the hospital uh, discharge or before the six week, the four weeks mark. The incidence of success at the uh, uh, for, uh, the, for the ultrasound at the four weeks mark is 80% to give you a good, good results. So uh, I wouldn't miss that time. The clicky hip for the other boy is not really uh, showing uh, a lot of question marks. So I would say that this could be a luteal band clicking or uh, either uh, uh, this. Yeah, I mean, this is what is expected in, the, in this age. What is your opinion, Professor Haney, as regards the, the rule of ultrasound? As uh, we see in, uh, in some countries, they do an ultrasound examination as a routine screening for any newborn in their hospitals, while other countries did not depend on it as a screening and only ask it for doing ultrasound for uh, babies with risk factors. Do you believe of uh, that? Uh, the, there's countries like Germany, they do uh, uh, ultrasound immediately after birth. Uh, some centers in the UK, they do that. But the studies uh, did not show much difference, really, having the ultrasound very early or at the four weeks mark. But uh, even if you have the ultrasound uh, showing uh, dysplasia of the hip at four weeks, you have to follow it up uh, definitely. But even if you don't have any uh, uh, positive data with the ultrasound at the four weeks, but the history is suggestive, you, you have really to follow up the child until you reach uh, a, safe, a safe stage. 
Okay, Tare, uh, Professor Tare, uh, I have two, one question for you as uh, regard, if you present this case without hip problem and you have a boy or baby with full deformity, you will ask for a screen ultrasound uh, examination as regard to evaluate other congenital anomalies, although the clinical examination is negative of the hip joint? No, my protocol uh, for screening is the selective screening. What I do is that I always advise that any baby should be examined clinically very well with the Barlow and Ortolani, like Professor Ali and Professor Haney said. And if in doubt by the pediatrician, by a trained pediatric orthopedic surgeon. And I only would do an ultrasound at the age of six weeks, even if I have the risk factors like in the first case scenario, even if she had a uh, club foot or whatever. The other thing uh, I disagree with Professor Ali about is that I would never do an X-ray because if I would like to detect uh, meningomyelocele, et cetera, I can detect it clinically, even sacral agenesis, et cetera. So the X-ray will expose the baby to, to a hazard of X-ray that is not needed and it will not give me the diagnosis. I will be able to diagnose any meningomyelocele clinically. Thank so you, will... my panel. Okay. Now we shift to uh, Dr. Shadi, who will tell us what we need to know about this problem at this age. Yes, Shadi, please. Thank you, sir. I think the uh, first problem to talk about is the difference between clicking hip and a clunks, which we can use to diagnose uh, DDHL. A clunk is a feel of motion. We feel a motion under our hand and even may see it during perforation of uh, Ortolani and Pablo test. And Pablo test. That's first. Second, imaging. We depend, we, de uh, we depend on ultrasound in early screening for uh, DDH. Because X-ray does, uh, because in the first six uh, months, the femoral head is not yet ossified. So the advantage of ultrasound is non-onizing radiation. I can visualize the cartilaginous femoral head and the disadvantage is an operator dependent and need a relaxed head to do it. Okay. Okay. As you can see here, this is the first. Okay. The uh, hip ultrasonography can be universal or selective. And this is a debatable issue. Also, it can be done at birth or at age of six weeks. Also, another debatable issue. And another debatable issue is ultrasound and clinical examination in the first six weeks enough to exclude DDH in uh, newborn because we know that stable hip at birth may become unstable later on or unstable hip at birth may stabilize at the age of six weeks. These are debatable questions and we try to answer them. As we all know that screening tests should be very highly sensitive and specific resulting uh, in nearly no false positive or negative cases. But this, this, there is no idea screening test for DDH until now. We depend on surveillance and doing clinical examination and ultrasound examination. Both are important and should be done and should be repeated. Next, please. Okay. Our first clinical proved evidence that we know that Germany and Austria both countries adopt universal ultrasound screening, regardless of the clinical risk factor. On the other hand, United States and United Kingdom perform universal clinical screening for all new needs and selective ultrasound screening only for high-risk patients or patients with positive or tolerant and parotist. In both, in all these countries, ultrasound usually done between four and six weeks of age. Okay. Okay. Also, in, uh, it is universal acceptance that ultrasound has reduced the number of late presenting cases and shortened the treatment time and decreased the number of surgical procedures of the hip joint. Okay. But there is an important question. Is, is uh, universal ultrasound has it uh, discovered DDH? It was found, no, there's no difference, no statistical difference between screening ultra, uh, specific screening ultrasound and universal screening in detecting, in detecting or preventing late 
É, presente e credente. Ok. Also, the earliest reliable time for ultrasound screening is the fourth day a week. After, uh, from the start of the, 20, of the 22 days and beyond. Because in the first three weeks, there is maybe minor, minor morphological changes and instability in the hip joint that may appear as dysplasia and patient may undergo unnecessary treatment with financial burdens for him. Okay, so what to do in the early diagnosis and severance to the H? First, all new, uh, all new needs should undergo clinical examination by barrel or training test. And selective ultrasound should be reserved for patients with high risk uh, factors or positive alternatives. It should be done from the age of four to six weeks. If ultrasound is positive, we will proceed for treatment. If negative, this doesn't mean that the patient is cleared. It should be followed up by clinical examination until walking age. Okay, thank, thank you, sir. Professor Shadi. Thank you, sir. Now we finish part one is the screening and what we do in the first six months. Now. We shift to part two of our webinar is the treatment within the first six months of life. Also, we present clinical scenario with baby girl referred to you with an eight, a two weeks old and a clicky right hip is detected during routine checkup. She requested by her physician to do ultrasound, which was reported as grave type three means complete dislocated hip. You, you did an examination of her and you detected positive ortolani test. Another clinical scenario that six weeks old B girl referred again to you by her pediatric physician because he detect also light hip click during the routine checkup. She requested ultrasound but the difference is the presence of this plastic hip, which is grave type 2C and not complete dislocation. And you do, when you did a clinical examination, you detected a positive ortolani test. What is uh, the uh, professor uh, Tar uh, discuss with me uh, how you proceed for treatment of such two cases? Okay, first of all, uh, now this baby is now the, has, an, has an, uh, a positive ultrasound, just this plastic, okay? And she's six weeks. This is the second one, Tore. First one, two weeks with complete dislocated hip by ultrasound. Okay, okay, so we'll discuss the first one. For yes. Weeks old, going back to, my, uh, to, to, to the question uh, I answered before, I would just document the clicky hip uh, on my examination. I will detect if, the, if this click is just a click like the pediatrician said, or it's actually a clunk, so I know whether there is a positive ortolani. If there is no positive ortolani, I will do a provocative test, which is the uh, barlow test, and try and dislocate the hip and then relocate it again. Document all this, but I will still not do an ultrasound except at the age of six weeks. My argument for this is that this baby might stabilize with time. So at the age of six weeks, I will do the ultrasound. And there is no point in doing an ultrasound at the age of two weeks because I will not treat. Now, I believe that any imaging or any investigation that doesn't lead to a change of the treatment plan is, you, is useless. It's an overuse of the resources and it just gives the false sense of worrying. So I will just document and tell the parents that there is a serious problem that needs to be rechecked at the age of six weeks. And then at the age of six weeks, depending on what I find, I will treat. This is the first one as regard the second baby, six weeks old. And he is presented with you as ultrasound showing this plastic hip. Okay. Now this is this is this is this is very debatable because this hip is just dysplastic. It is not dislocated. There is no direct evidence that wearing the pelvic harness will improve the dysplasia, and there is no direct evidence even until now that a minor degree of dysplasia, such as this one detected at birth, will end up in late osteoarthritis. So again, I would be very reluctant to put on a pelvic harness, which is very disabling. 
I will give a, I will give a further chance for this baby and repeat the ultrasound after another three weeks. And then if the dysplasia is improving, I can just carry on. If the dysplasia persists in spite of reaching the nine weeks or 10 weeks, then I will reluctantly put on the pelvic harness for a very short period of time and follow it up very soon and make sure that the dysplasia is improving. So I'm not really concerned very much at the dysplasia. But if this, if this scenario would be the opposite, so six weeks and dislocated and the dislocated hip, then I would definitely put on the harness as early as six weeks. So you, do, you will depend on the age at time of presentation, not on ultrasound examination. Yes, and also because the ultrasound, as you know, is operator dependent. So if you get two, ult, two uh, trained pediatric uh, musculoskeletal radiologists and ask them to measure, you know, the, the, the graph staging is depending on the alpha and beta angles, and they are numbers. And uh, the person who draws the baseline and draws the alpha angle and the beta angle, it's a human person who puts the markers and then just measures the angle. So maybe the same person, the, I mean, the intra and inter observer errors are very, very high in this. So the same person might measure the same angle twice as 55 and once as 50 and once as 60, and two, and two uh, radiographers may measure them different values. So I'm not how, really... how, how can, Professor Tar, we solve this problem, as you said, that it is a radiodiagnostic dependency factor? How, is there any other modality for the evaluation and to confirm the diagnosis of such cases at that age? No, not at this age. Uh, yes. I, I, I know you're trying to, um, to attract me to, to, to talk about the role of MRI, etc., but not at this age and not for this reason. MRI we might discuss later when we want to check out the concentricity of our reduction. Okay. But at this stage, at this stage, the only investigation, unfortunately, that you can depend on, and okay. I say unfortunately because this operator dependent, and I say it's very variable. So I'd only be concerned if at six weeks I have a dislocated or dislocatable hip and I will put the pelvic harness on immediately. If it's yeah. just dysplasia, I will give another three weeks. And then if, it's, if the per dysplasia persists, then I will very re reluctantly put on the public harness for a short duration of time and then scan. I want to hear the opinion of Professor Hany about these two cases. This first case, two weeks with positive, complete dislocated hip. What is your opinion, Professor Hany? Professor Rani? Okay, the Professor Rani is connected. I think Professor Ali with me. Yes. What yes. is your opinion, Professor Dr. Rani? Okay, yes. turn back. Please, please, Professor Rani. Yeah. I, 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 in, in two weeks' age, uh, the diagnosis is not settled, whatever it is. Diagnosis of dislocated hip is not really causing a ma major problem because we know that it can relocate and it can. Uh, uh, go on uh, without any problem. <clears throat> but I would try to really relocate the hip and put a double nappies on at this age. I yes. know it's not really uh, going to uh, help a lot, but at least this is not causing any harm. Okay, what about the boy, baby with speech with this kid by ultrasound? Do you leave him that, like first one, or you proceed for application some divers or public harness? Uh, uh, in six weeks' time, I would put double nappies and recheck again in three to four weeks. If it's not improving, I would put I would put a public harness, as Professor Tarek said. But I uh, I wouldn't leave uh, uh, the the hip as it is without any interference, knowing it is dislocatable. I would I would put a double nappies on. It's not going to cause any harm. It may help a lot. At least oh. the parents would know that they are on the line of treatment. So, uh, on basics basis of Nabil, this two cases. panel, Dr. Nabil, please for the panel who is talking can open the video, please. For the panel who is talking, okay. he, he must open the video. Okay. Okay, Professor. <laughs> Return back, Professor Hani. You, uh, you ask it when you will ask for application of the public harness as regard these two cases. You first one follow up and second one double nappies because it didn't know dislocated. But I assume that the six weeks old boy, baby has a complete dislocated hip, 
Do you advise to do a public harness plenty? Yes, yes. Yes. In six weeks' time, I would start treatment immediately. I put yes. public harness carry on and follow up with ultrasound every three weeks until everything is settled down. So you apply public harness for this baby and you do an ultrasound follow-up. Yeah. First ultrasound immediately after application of the public. And you found that the head is not contained. What will do? I would leave the, the, the public harness as it is and follow yes. up with ultrasound. Because public harness takes a little bit of time for the hip to be re relocated. I'm not expecting as soon as I put the public harness on that it will relocate. It will take some time. So my, my role is to carry on the follow up until it is relocated and then we'll, we'll continue the follow up afterwards. Okay, assuming that at the end of the three weeks you do an ultrasound for the hip and it is not concentrically reduced. And the baby now is 12 weeks of age. Do you proceed for another line of treatment for this baby or leave him? 12 weeks is not a very uh, uh, late time. I mean, you, can, you have to give a time for the public harness to work. But you did an X uh, ultrasound and the hip is not contained. You still if, resist. If there's on... no abductor tightness, if yes. there's no abductor tightness, I would wait. I may change the public harness uh, straps itself, increase yeah. the flexion, increase the abduction gradual. Uh, there is a way you can uh, play with the public harness. You can increase the gradu deflection gradually from 70 to 90 to 120 degrees flexion and then start abduction. So uh, this can help. Uh, uh, it's not uh, a splint. You can put it and leave it. It's a dynamic yeah. splint. Yes. So you can't play with the, with the public harness until you reach whatever you think is uh, the proper reduction. Okay. Professor Ali, I want to ask you about the public. Uh, what are the precautions or requirements you, you, you put in mind during application? Two, aiming for concentric reduction of the hip, number one. Number two, to avoid the complication which may be take place with this public harness. Yes. Uh, actually, I would apply public hardness even in this plastic hip because it is a lively split and a dynamic and it will enhance the development of the hip even if it is only this plastic. That yeah. point I disagree with uh, Professor Tan. Uh, flexion. And uh, we should not do too much abduction. We have avoid to keep what? the hip in a safe zone of movement to avoid AVN. And uh, this is a great uh, complication for the baby. Yes. And to avoid uh, also femoral nerve compression and uh, ulceration of the skin if uh, the flexion. Okay. So the problem. Return back to Professor Tarek. Uh, if Shanfo we are very near to each other, if it is too much flexion. Uh, another point, if the flexion, it can cause inferior uh, dislocation of the hip. Yes. So we have to okay. keep it, to keep the active movement in a safe zone and to avoid too much abduction and too much flexion. Okay, thank you. Professor Tarek. If we decide and the assuming that the is contained and concentrically reduced in the public, how much, how, how long do you leave the baby in the public harness to uh, reach the final containment and reduction of this hip? Okay, excellent question. Just before I answer it, I just want to add uh, one little piece of information. The public harness is very, very difficult and cumbersome to be worn by the baby. And it causes a lot of distress to the parents to look after the baby in the harness. That's why I, I would not apply it unless it is really necessary. That's why even in the just the dysplastic hip, I'm very reluctant to put it on until giving a further chance. And also when I put it on, if the, like Professor Haney said, we do not expect immediate reduction, it should reduce gradually, but what I disagree with is that if at, after three weeks of wearing it, it doesn't reduce, 
then I know I, I uh, announce the failure of the pelvic harness and I discard it and I decide on another treatment. Now, going back to your initial question, which is how, how long to wear it, I wear, the, I, I, I advise the harness to be worn, very simple uh, rule, as long as the, the age of the baby at the time of wearing it. So if the baby wears it when she is six weeks, then she has to wear it for six weeks, day and night, continuously, with only half an hour allowed to be taken off for bathing of the baby, and then it should be reapplied. And then after, after this, I start to wean it off gradually, in a similar period of time. That's why when, when the hip is really dislocated and I want the benefit of the pelvic harness, it is best to wear it at the age of six weeks, which is very young, because this means that the baby will wear it for six weeks completely and then get weaned off it in another six weeks. But if the baby is three months at the time of wearing it, then you have to wear it for three months and then wean off in another, in another three months. And then you start going past the six month age in which the baby wants to sit up, wants maybe even to crawl in some babies. So it's really very, very difficult for the parents to comply with. Okay, thank you. Now we shift to Dr. Ahmed Saeed, who tell us what we need to know about the requirements and the shape or method of application of this public harness. Please, Ahmed. Thank you, Dr. Nabil. Um, we would like to confirm the idea of public harness in treatment uh, of uh, baby after uh, before age of six months and uh, we aim to make a concentric reduction of the femoral head inside the acetabulum by using the public harness um, and avoiding the most common complication which is the vascular necrosis as we uh, will show okay uh, the most important two straps used in public harness is the anterior or flexor strap and the posterior one. We have chest strap and the two shoulder strap, leg straps, and the most important is the anterior flexor, which used for our, or to flex uh, the hip, uh, and the posterior strap, which used to prevent the adduction of the hip. Uh, not to making it too flexion or too abduction, but it to prevent extension and adduction. So it is a dynamic straps, not a static straps and not a rigid or a stiff um, instrument, okay? Hip is flexed to 90 degree or 100 degree of flexion because more flexion will cause posterior or inferior dislocation of the hip and they may cause femoral nerve palsy. So we don't flex the hip behind 100 or 120 degree of flexion. Also, uh, abduction is used within the safe zone of rams. Making a maximum abduction, then decreasing the abduction for 14, uh, 45 degree, um, because more abduction will cause an EVN or a vascular necrosis. And when we put the hip in neutral position, it will dislocate the hip. We should, uh, like our professor said, we should uh, investigate or uh, make sure that the hip is contained inside by making ultrasound weekly. Um, and uh, 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 each time we should examine the stability of the hip by doing parlant or Tulani test. Okay. Uh, then, okay, Dr. Nabi. How time or duration of wearing the public harness? Duration, we uh, make the public harness or put the public harness all day time, 23 hours, and make it off for one hour to make pathing or to make anything for the baby. Till the age or till the time that the hip uh, reaching the stability by Parlo and Ortolani test and by the ultrasound, all of this confirm it that the hip reaching the stability, then we could put the public harness for more three months uh, after gaining the stability. And after that, we go with gradual weaning of the public harness. The most common two complication, uh, which we should know, a vascular necrosis, when we make maximum abduction in public harness, and the public harness disease, which is a debatable, as we see in the literature, public harness disease 
when we put public harness on a dislocated hip for more than three to four weeks, it will erode against the superior lateral acetabulum and causing eccentric loading and eroding the superior lateral acetabulum. So after a while, we should discontinue the public harness to avoid such a complication. The indications of the public harness, uh, as we said, below six months and reducible hip. And the contraindication, if the head is not reducible, like syndromatic hip dislocation or a stiff hip, or in the case of paralytic hip dislocation. Uh, when we see the uh, review of literature, which is the most important, uh, in Journal of Children Orthopedic, an exciting uh, paper published uh, that said, after the age of six months, it is difficult to immobilize the larger and increasing active child with public harness type. Show so uh, we, we must not wear the public harness after the age of six months. The upper age limit is six months age. Uh, Atler et al. Uh, publishing in SICO International Orthopedic and recommending also not to use the public harness in syndromatic hip dislocation like arthrogryposis or neuromuscular hip dislocation like spina bifida or cerebral palsy. Uh, so uh, he put the indication for public harness, only the congenital or developmental hip dislocation, not neuromuscular, not syndromatic hip dislocation. Uh, Sankar et al. putting a very nice article in GBO, which uh, supported the idea of Prof. Hani Hefni. Uh, about he examined 38 patients with dislocated hip in public harness. And he followed uh, these babies for longer duration to see if the dislocated hip uh, inside the public harness and uh, they continue more than three weeks, they really uh, causing superior lateral acetabular eroding and really causing a public harness disease. He concluded that 80% uh, of the hip in public harness treatment who successfully um, uh, put in the public harness, although dislocated, they relocated again and the hip is relocated inside the acetabulum for 14 weeks. So he recommends using the public harness in infants up to 14 weeks, uh, nearly more than three months, even the hip is dislocated. And he reported that there is no any uh, public harness disease occurred or posterior superior erosion occurred in the acetabulum as he using alpha angle as indication of the acetabular dysplasia or bony acetabular dysplasia uh, by ultrasound. So he recommend to use uh, public harness even in dislocated hip in more than three to four weeks, up to 14 weeks, and no fear of uh, public harness disease or erosion of the establishment. Thank you. Let, let me, Ahmed, to ask you about uh, one question uh, that you, you asked us. Public harness is not advised to be weird after the age of six months. Why? Uh, because the baby will be uh, get more larger and uh, more stronger, uh, he need to crawling and uh, increasing activity uh, during crawling make it very difficult to put the public harness. So he will need to extend the hip to adduct the hip to making the crawling. So increasing activity and uh, 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 body weight of the baby making the failure rate of public harness is very high. So uh, we need uh, weight. Uh, under age of six, age of under six month and uh, controllable uh, baby, uh, no increasing of the activity or uh, or or making crawling. Thank you, Ahmed. Now we shift to uh, part three of our our webinar tonight is the treatment after the age of six months. Also, we will present a clinical scenario cases and discuss with our panels and speakers how we can solve these problems. This clinical scenario that we have a girl, old baby, seven months age girl presented to you because her mother noted shortening and limited abduction of her left hip. And you did an examination and shown in the figures that he has, she has limited abduction and shortening of the left lower limb. This one scenario, put in mind that the age is seven months and you ask it for a plain X-ray for this girl. Uh, now I will ask Professor Haney, uh, how, sir, you can proceed for management and treatment of this girl? Uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Naveed, for asking me. Uh, on examination, as you can see now, the hip is clearly dislocated. And I think at the age of seven months, we have to rethink again about having a closed reduction by trying a ductal tenotomy, checking under image intensifier if this can be reduced. And if it's reduced, fine, we put the public harness on, a spike on. Uh, there is a lot of literature now is coming that you can even with a late presenting children, you can put them in a public harness and manipulate the public harness gradually. And there's no reports uh, for uh, AVN or any problems. And there is a study in Florida done by uh, Chad Chris Price, who, who is the director of the International Hip Dysplasia Institute in Florida, uh, as he studied the late presenting uh, children between the six month and, uh, and five years or four years with a closed reduction. What he does is he uses the public harness to increase the flexion until you get the head underneath the establishment, below the establishment and hook it in by abduction to reduce. And he's, he's presenting a very good series with a 90%, more than 96% success rate with no AVN or femoral nerve pulse. Actually, he did this on the study done by uh, Papirlo in, 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 in Greece. And he sent a team to study this there and he, he came back with the results and they are doing this now. We don't have this experience, but I believe in our hands now, we do a closed reduction by a ductal tenotomy under imaging to inspire, but it's a worthwhile to think about this technique again. He uses what, what is called Hoffman-Daimler technique, modified Hoffman-Daimler technique. Thank okay. you. You, you. You decide to do for hair closed reduction. Yes. You, how can we uh, decide that the head is concentrically used uh, uh, after closed reduction intraoperative inside the theater? Well, actually, we have an experience with this by the image intensifier. Yes. Uh, AP and lateral view. It is difficult to have a lateral view, yes, but we can do that. Ultrasound is very helpful, but after reduction, you can do an MRI if you want to. Okay. Professor Tar, do you agree for that that closed reduction isolated? We don't need to do an arthrography for this after closed reduction. Uh, excuse me. First of all, uh, I just want to uh, to uh, pay my respects to Professor Haney, but I I I would suggest a different treatment. I do not believe at all in the practicality of closed reduction because to do a to do a successful closed reduction you need two things you need to do as professor haney said an adductor tenotomy and you also need to do an arthrography the mri is a very good way but it will only tell you the result after you have applied the spica and the child has gone out of the theater um, the ultrasound, you will not be able to do once the spica is applied. So the only way you can ensure it intraoperatively is by doing the arthrography. I myself, in, over the years, I have repeatedly tried to do a successful arthrogram. It is a very difficult technique because what you usually put the needle, you inject a little bit of the dye, you find that you're not really intraarticular, then you get a little... You, you move your needle a, a, a milli or two, then you re another another milli of the dye. And what you end up is that you end up with the whole with the whole proximal femur covered in dye, and you cannot detect your medial pool. So what I would do for this baby at the age of seven months, I would go in and do an open reduction. It is very, very simple, and I would still do it through the inferior approach. I would not go for, through the, for the medial approach. 
because I find it very difficult and, and it has an increased incidence of AVN in the literature. So I would definitely go for an open reduction. And then I, even, even when I operate on these babies, I'm not extremely happy at the end of the operation when I look with the image intensifier on the hip spica because I don't have an ossific center. I just rely on the proximal femur. But then I have to ha get an MRI, like Professor Haney said. This is a very good way because actually, if you look at the post-operative evaluation using something like the CT scan, which we, will, we, we usually do in older babies, you have to remember very well that every single CT you do to these babies is equivalent in the millisieverts, which is the unit of radiation measure, to 200 plain x-rays. Yes, 200. So now using the MRI is very good, particularly when you don't have an ossific center. You proceeding. Uh, I proceed. Uh, you, you 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 answer my next question. But first, Professor Ali. Uh, after I, I agree with Professor Henny that closed reduction is the ideal treatment, and we have lack of experience doing arthrography. But assuming that we did for this girl is a closed reduction for her. The yes. image that inspires the anthropocentric view the head is concentrically reduced, but sometimes. Chin is reduced, everything is okay, but I'm not sure that the head is concentrically reduced because I didn't see the lateral view. How can I judge that or the, is there any other modality for evaluating that? I'm sorry, I was disconnected uh, by the internet. Okay, if, if, Tar, if, Tar, if Tar is heard my question, yeah. can you answer? My point of view is to do closed reduction, maybe assisted by a doctor tenotomy, and to assess the position after that, we can do either uh, multi-sectional MRI or CT. But to be sure doctor... that it is a concentrically reduced. Mm -hmm. reduced. You ask it for CT. Yeah. Okay. Another, yeah. cl another clinical scenario for the same age, but older one, we have an old baby, 18 months, who is presented with this video. I will show you now. This is the gate of the girl. Okay. And she has a Trudlenberg gate, as we noted. And we, you ask it for this plain X-ray. Do you change your mind, Professor Annie, for the line of treatment for this girl? She's 18 months. I, I think it's not very high dislocation and it can be reduced nicely. Open reduction will do it fine. So we'll, uh, if we put the hip in uh, during surgery and we find it stable, I would leave things alone and put an, uh, do a proper uh, capsule plication and put a spike on. If it is not stable and it needs a femoral problem, needs a varus osteotomy, we'll do the varus osteotomy. If she, if she needs a, a, a salt osteotomy, we'll do that. But before we go to surgery, we have to have a 3D CT scan to assess where is the problem. Is it acetabular or femoral? In my view, it can come nicely reduced without any uh, osteotomy. Okay, can you judge about uh, your opinion about the evaluation of the head or the acetabulum by plain X-ray to, to, because some places has no CT scan and uh, uh, it is an exposure to radio, uh, radiation for the baby. Can we end only on this X-ray to confirm uh, yes. what I need to do? Yes, yes. As I said, it, it looks like that it can be reduced nicely. During surgery, okay. you can take the decision. If it is stable, you do it after proper application, fine. If not, you do a virus osteotomy. Okay. After that, you will apply a complete cast. For how long, if you did for the girl close reduction, Professor Haney, how, how long do you leave the plaster in the girl? How long time? For this girl? Yes. I would put it six weeks and change the spike at another six weeks, so three months altogether. Okay. Shift again to Tariq. Uh, please, uh, your opinion. 
Uh, my opinion is that for this baby, I would do an open reduction, full stop. I will not ask for a preoperative CT because it will not change my plan. I will not, I'm not going to do any Salter or any femoral osteotomy for anybody before under the age of three years. So I will only going to rely on open reduction and the rest is going to come with remodeling. And I do not want to expose the baby to a preoperative CT, which is equivalent to 200 chest X-rays that will not change my decision. And I'm very confident that this would be reduced only by open reduction, provided the open reduction is done well and the uh, capsulography is done correctly and all the steps are, uh, we know about are done. And I would put her in one and a half spica for three months. And then after this, I will not put any hip abduction braces or anything, just allow her to start moving. What are the precautions during reduction, open reduction, Professor Tare, for this girl during open reduction? What, uh, what, uh, what are the uh, points the surgeon take care of it to avoid complication of such case? I think uh, most most of us know know know, know the steps, I, I, but I find that uh, I, I know this from my experience in doing uh, recurrent cases referred from elsewhere. That the single two two things that a lot of people forget about. One is dividing the transverse acetabular ligament, and number two is is good cleaning of the acetabulum. Now, obviously, there are very basic things that go without saying, like if, if, for example, you get somebody with a recurrent dislocation and the surgeon has not divided, the, has not done an adductor tenotomy or has not divided the iliopsoas tendon, for example. These are basic things that if you do, you will not get a concentric reduction and you'll get a recurrence. Yeah. But the two very uh, critical things that a lot of people find difficult to do, and so maybe sometimes they skip them, is dividing the transverse acetabular ligament and uh, cleaning the acetabulum very well from the pulvinar. This to, uh, to give you the chance to concentrically reduce the head inside the acetabulum. But what you, uh, you must take care of what during reduction? That it, it will not be tight during reduction? You may need here shortening of the femur to reduce the head? Or this is this girl? Yes. No, not at all. No. Okay. I, 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 varus and varus the rotation and pelvic osteotomy I will not do before the age of three. Pelvic, femoral shortening I will never do do before the age of four or five un, unless you really have a high dislocation. Never. I will never do this in this baby. Okay. Let us to shift to another clinical scenario of the same age with older one with one month baby, a girl baby presented with not walked yet and the treating physician suspected DDH. He requested X-ray, and as you see, it is an active rickets. Uh, can you comment on it, Professor Tar, for this message this shortly? Because it is an everyday work that we, uh, the pediatric physician sent you limp child with, uh, and told him he has DDH, and you do an X-ray, and we find an active rickets. So, so you you must put in mind that the baby has other metabolic other diseases to exclude rather than DDH. You agree with me? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And a lot of late presenting babies with DDH have come to me with the opposite situation. They went to their doctor and they are complaining that their daughter is limping on her left leg, for example. And the pediatrician or maybe even the general orthopedic surgeon tells them that, oh, okay, that your child has rickets. He doesn't even do an x-ray. He doesn't do labs. And he prescribes vitamin, vitamin D and calcium. And then the baby keeps on limping until they reach you when the baby is two and a half or three years old. Thank so you. the message is that uh, DDH by itself is not a cause of delayed walking. And uh, unilateral limping will not be caused by rickets. Okay, now we shift to what we need to know about the treatment of this age group before uh, 18 months. Yes, please, Ahmed. Thank you again, Dr. Nabil. Uh, we, uh, we need to know about closed reduction and the hip spike versus open reduction. There is a lot of algorithm 
uh, to determine uh, when to go with the closed reduction and when to go in open reduction alone or when to go open reduction with femoral or pelvic osteotomy. A lot of literature putting uh, the uh, algorithm according to uh, the age of the child and another according to the primary dysplasia, or where the establish dysplasia or femoral, like coxa valga or femoral uh, antiverge. Um, okay. So uh, closed reduction, usually uh, uh, we can do closed reduction up to one and a half years. Uh, after failure of the public harness, after six months, up to one and a half year, you can do closed reduction. But uh, there is a lot of parameter and the precaution to do this closed reduction. Uh, it should be done under general anesthesia and using arthrography and to determine the medial dye hole that the head is fully contained inside the stabulum and usually uh, you need to do adductor tenotomy and to putting the PP in the spike. Um, if filled or um, you don't have the parameter to, to the closed reduction, you should shift to open reduction. Uh, we should uh, differentiate between developmental dislocation of the hip and traumatic hip dislocation. Uh, we cannot do a simple closed reduction and we relocate the head inside the stapulum, but in developmental dysplasia of the hip, we have uh, many obstacles, intra-articular and the extra-articular. Intra-articular like the pulvinar fibro fatty tissue or lig uh, thickened ligamentum teres and transverse stapular ligament, inverted labrum, limpus, and extra-articular like the iliopsoas and adductor tenotomy, all of this should be released to achieve stable concentric redu reduced hip. After uh, making the reduction, we should do the next uh, important step in the capsulography. By uh, most popular is to do T incision or uh, vertical and transverse incision and advance the superior lateral uh, part of the capsule inferiorly to tighten the capsule anteriorly and making the hip stable, especially if we do open reduction alone. Um, okay. Uh, this is uh, the T incision and the uh, superior lateral capsule. Um, to achieve the uh, satisfactory reduction, either by uh, closed reduction or by uh, open reduction, we should uh, 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 obtain clinically stable uh, hip um, and not, un, uh, not needing for extreme position like severe abduction or severe flexion or severe internal rotation to relocate, uh, to relocate the hip. It should be uh, a stable hip, not in extreme position and intact restoration to line and one rosen line. Uh, and it is difficult to do, like Dr. Han and Dr. Tarek said, uh, uh, lateral view under image intensifier inside the intraoperative uh, period. Uh, a post-operative after closed or open reduction, a hip spike like public harness, we do it in 100 degree of flexion, 45 degree abduction. If we do open reduction alone, you need some sort of internal rotation. And if there is osteotomy, like femoral derotational osteotomy, putting the head in neutral uh, position. And the total period of immobilization, it is a debatable issue, but the most common uh, and the most practical from two and a half months till three months of duration. And we need to do CT axial cut, especially thin cut, which is showing both femoral head uh, against the triradiate cartilage and the uh, femoral capital epiphysis is pointing to the triradiate cartilage in this important cut of CT. Okay. Back, in, to the, back to the literature, um, in the Journal of American Academy, which published in uh, 2001, they concluded that children uh, have a successful closed reduction up to 22 months. Up to 22 months, you can do a successful closed reduction in DDH. But they put a strict information that they should do arthrography inside the surgery. And they concluded that arthrographic evaluation had significantly less incidence of avascular necrosis when compared with those treated by closed reduction without arthrographic guidance. And if they maintain a stable hip with ar uh, arthrography and they uh, make the success if the medial dipole less than five millimeter, so the head is concentrically reduced and uh, making uh, the PP in, uh, in hip spike. And if the arthrography showing unstable hip 
or more than seven millimeter of medial dipole, they will shift to another modality of treatment like the open reduction. So they depend on arthrography in uh, uh, evaluation of uh, concentric reduction and uh, successful reduction up to two uh, or one and a half years uh, child. <clears throat> On another side, McEwen um, publishing an article in Journal of Bone and uh, Joint and concluded that we can do closed reduction without arthrography. We can uh, 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 making another modality to assess the concentric reduction rather than the arthrography, like doing a CT scan, axial cut, post-operative in hip spica. And uh, they depend on the anterior shunto line. Anterior shunto line is a um, line draw in this axial cut between the anterior symphysis pubis and the anterior neck of the femur. If the anterior shunto line is resumed, this is considered successful closed reduction. And if there is broken anterior shunto line like a photo in the left side, there is a, a, a need another modality like open reduction. So they don't depend on arthrography in evaluation of closed reduction. Okay. Uh, this, bar, uh, this important topic in Journal of Children Orthopedic, uh, they confirm what we said about the position of the PP inside the hip spica, whether after closed reduction or after open reduction, and we should not put the PP in extreme hip abduction, because if we put the PP in extreme hip abduction, it will end up by a vascular necrosis. So we need abduction less than 45 degree. Although here in, in GPO, uh, uh, stressed on the total amount of immobilization in hip spica, after closed reduction or after open reduction, that the ideal period of immobilization is equal to three months. Without need to exchange the cast, uh, unless if it is uh, it remain clean and not tight, you cannot exchange the cast in this period of three months. Okay. We shift to open reduction. Uh, literature said, uh, and confirming what uh, Prof. Tare uh, said about it, um, the most common cause of redislocation after open reduction is not cutting transverse stabular ligament. This considered the most common cause of redislocation and revision surgery in TDH. So uh, you should orient it well uh, about the intra-articular and extra-articular obstacles for reduction, especially the transverse stabular ligament, which is the most common cause. Uh, Stricker also uh, making a comparative study between if we do open reduction, uh, can we do a preoperative traction or we do intraoperative femoral shortening? So he compared between both methods, between preoperative, especially in high hip dislocation in older, uh, elder child, uh, above three years, age old. Uh, and he concluded, concluded that if we do preoperative skeletal traction, there is incidence of 54 percentage of osteonecrosis. And if we do intraoperative femoral shortening, the incidence in his literature is zero for a vascular necrosis. So he recommends to do femoral shortening with open reduction if there is high dislocation, especially in elder children above three years, and do not recommend preoperative traction to decrease or to make the head at a lower level, okay? Uh, the most important and the most interesting uh, topic uh, or articles is the uh, Arslan's in Journal of Children Orthopedic. And uh, I recommend this article uh, for uh, um, anyone who needs to uh, involve it in DDH surgery because he make a very clear point uh, in this idea. Arslan con uh, concluded that uh, the single stage surgical procedure was more economical and allowed more rapid recovery uh, more than or, and less complication than consecutive operation. So he recommend a single stage surgery. Second, he have an excellent uh, outcome in his old uh, baby with only doing femoral shortening or femoral derotation or pelvic osteotomy with open reduction without doing any varization. So he answered the questions. 
Is virus osteotomy necessary in one stage treatment of developmental dislocation in older children? And his answer is no. He didn't do any virization or any virus osteotomy. And he considered that derotation is the key in the femoral osteotomy with or without femoral shortening. And the virus has no role in Ahmed, you are mute, Ahmed. صوت عندك ميوت محدش سامع. Although the Journal of American Academy confirmed this point uh, of Arslan that femoral virus producing osteotomy have a role in treatment of children with neuromuscular disease, including cerebral palsy. However, virus osteotomy combined with open reduction has little or no role in treatment of DDH. Um, our grateful to make an application uh, that will be published on October. Uh, 2020 in current uh, pediatric orthopedic, how to determine the type of femoral osteotomy. And uh, this paper is done in Ain Shams uh, University uh, Department of Orthopedic, how to determine the type of femoral osteotomy and management of developmental dysplasia of the hip. We answer this debate uh, according to the following point. Femoral shortening osteotomy is a must in any high hip dislocation. So if we have a high hip dislocation, especially in elderly children, we should do femoral shortening uh, to avoid tight reduction and to avoid a vascular necrosis like Schenker et al. Uh, said in GBO. Uh, femoral derotation osteotomy, FDO, or femoral derotation alone, because a lot of baby, when we make internal rotation, we will uh, uh, see that the neck shaft angle is normal and he has no coxa valga, but it is apparent because of increase femoral antiversion. So we will, uh, when we exclude the femoral antiversion by putting internal rotation of the femur and the making the true anteroposterior view, you will see that there is no coxa and the only excessive femoral antiversion. So in this group of patients that have a normal neck shaft angle below than 140, we do femoral derotation only and the additional varization is unnecessary and the better to be avoided. While if we do this internal rotation and there is increased femoral antiversion, virus derotation femoral osteotomy is done, and we do varization in our osteotomy. But be careful, when varization is done, make a minimal varization as possible to achieve containment and the stable hip, because varization make limb length discrepancy, varization make a persistent Trendenberg sign, varization make residual coxavara may persist until adolescence, and we may need a revascular revalgarization or valgus osteotomy. And lastly, uh, residual coxavara may cause compensatory genovalgum. So it is better to be avoided if unnecessary. And if you do virus osteotomy, make it as minimal as possible. Thank you, Dr. Sure, thank, uh, you. Uh, thank you. We shift now to part uh, four of our uh, webinar today is uh, the complications of treatment. The, as we uh, going on, we are working on clinical scenario cases. You have a girl with two, two years old, diagnosed with right DDH. She underwent an open reduction and immobilized in hip spica, 45 degree in abduction and full internal rotation. And uh, she do an uh, shortening with, after that, removal of the bed, as we see in this X-ray. And the follow-up X-ray, immediate post-operative during spica immobilization and after spica removal, or confirmed that she had a, success, she had a successful concentric reduction. At one year, one year follow-up, plain X-ray revealed this complete disappearance of the ossific nucleus. I will go to Professor uh, Tare to comment on this uh, scenario and the X-ray. Uh, this baby, unfortunately, has developed one of the uh, most devastating complications following treatment of DDH. And I mean what I say when I say most devastating because the other serious complication we will talk about is recurrence. And if you have a recurrent DDH, you still have a good chance of uh, doing a revision operation. But unfortunately, if you have AVN, then most probably you can do nothing. You can do very little to it. And this hip is doomed to be um, affected throughout life. Uh, when I said um, that it is uh, devastating, and I also said that it is complication of treatment, because if you 
have ever seen a baby, a, a child, an, an adult who is now maybe 18 years old with a neglected DDH, you will find that the head is not avascular. It is, it is completely vascular, even though it is maybe a little bit deformed. So it is, it is an iatrogenic complication. Uh, why it develops, we don't know. Uh, there are a lot of risk, risk factors, like maybe Dr. Shady will tell us about, but I, I, I will not go into them now. But even if you are very aware of them and take good care that you do not uh, expose yourself to these risk factors, you might still end up with this complication. Uh, it is irreversible usually, and you end up with a limb length discrepancy, and it's, it's difficult, it's really difficult to manage. Do you, do you have any any uh, suspected uh, reasons for uh, taking place after one year? And uh, how can we expect that avascular necrosis could take place for how long time after my intervention? It might, unfortunately, it might happen. I mean, in, in, my, in, in, my, in my practice, I have seen it happen maybe up to as late as 18 months. But if you read in the literature, it might even happen as late as five years. So it is, it is very, very, very unpredictable. That's what I say. It's very unpredictable. It's very unfortunate. And once you have it, you know that this hip is doomed. Whatever you do, maybe Dr. Shady will go through some of the treatment options. But whatever you do, this hip will not be normal. I mean, if you have a, if you have a recurrent dislocation, then you might tell the parents, okay, don't worry. We have a, we have a, we'll have a difficult operation. We'll have a difficult time. But at the end of the day, you might end up with a good result. But with this one, no, you know that you're going to have a disabled hip throughout life. Professor Hani, uh, do you expect that the problem is in the surgeon or in the patient as a surgeon during, uh, during treatment or during operative intervention or po post-reduction and osteotomy? Or it is a problem of pre-operative evaluation of the patient to reach to that? I think putting the, the, uh, the, the leg in full internal rotation has a role in this uh, area. Uh, and I think this is what is clearly uh, expected. We should not put uh, the, reduction, the reduced hip in an extreme position whatsoever. If we have to put it in extreme position, that means that we have either a problem of rotation or problem of reduction. Uh, we should put it in mild abduction, mild flexion. Uh, the hip should be uh, at ease where after the reduction and stable. If we, we do not reach this situation, we will have a problem such as this problem. The problem is now, what are you going to do with this case? Yes. You can do, if you want to have a stable hip in this age, you can put an, a, a fibula transplant, as we we have done before. You take the a fibula and stick it into the stump of this neck, and and put the hip in and leave the head to grow gradually. It will grow and it will look, it will look like a person's disease. Uh, if you want to wait, you can wait until skeletal maturity and put put a, a pelvic uh, uh, support osteotomy. Is there any rule for us corrective osteotomy for this girl or hoping to uh, revascularization of this head as a line uh, of treatment of this case? I, I don't think revascularization is the aim here because you won't find a head to revascularize. But you can yes. put a fibular graft, uh, uh, the, physician, uh, the, the head of the fibula, at this age, you can put it in and it will take and it will grow. It will not grow as, as, as the other side, but it will grow and it will have a support and it will have a tethered effect so she can walk on this hip. And you can give her a good hip for a while. If she's happy to continue, as we had a, a series of 25 years follow up with such cases, mm -hmm. and they were reasonably doing well, if you have a problem, you can always go back the pelvic support of the Yes, sir. Now we shift to Dr. Shadi, who tell us what we need to know about this problem and how we can avoid its occurrence from this. Yes, Shadi.
Thank you, Professor Nabil. Thank you, Professor Nabil. Okay. Okay. At first, we should have a little uh, hint about the blood supply of the proximal femur, as it depends on the medial circumflex femoral artery. So the pro uh, proximal femur is highly susceptible to any blockage of this vessel, vessel especially with hip abduction. Okay. Okay. As we, uh, our professor said, it is a atherogenic uh, complication. It is caused by surge. Uh, what we can see in X-ray that make us suspicious of this condition is we can see the femoral head delayed ossifications up to one year after the operation. Also, we can see widening of the femoral neck within one year of the operation. Also, the head, femoral head may appear sclerotic or fragmented. Also, there may be widening of the femoral head, increased size of the femoral head. Okay. Okay. So, what is the outcome of avascular necrosis? Back, please. Okay. Avascular necrosis can lead to limb blood discrepancy and uh, can cause coxa brevia or coxa varga or, uh, or, uh, or coxa vara which may lead to a severe dysplasia and joint incongruity and later lead to a vascular, uh, to osteoarthritis. Okay. There is a famous theory that's... Back, please, sir. There is a famous theory that correlate uh, ossification of the head femur to decrease the rate of a vascular neurosis. This is a debatable issue and we will discuss later on. Next, please, sir. Okay. In a systematic review published in the Journal of Children Orthopedic, uh, the author finds that the over rate of vascular necrosis in closed reduction is about 10%, and it can occur up to seven and a half years following closed reduction. Next. In another systematic review uh, published in Medicine uh, Journal, the author found that the incidence of OVN range from 5 to 57 percent for upper reduction versus 2 to 20 percent for close reduction. So they concluded that upper reduction is considered a risk factor for increased incidence of AVN when compared to close reduction in patients less than three years old. Okay, the current teacher, as we said before, that does the osophic nucleus present osophic nucleus decrease the risk of avascular necrosis. In a, paper, in a review published uh, in a review published in a journal of bone and joint surgery, they, they also find that the current literature does not support the hypothesis of present osophic, that the present osophic nucleus causes reduction of the risk of avascular necrosis. On the other hand, okay, sir. On the other hand, in a research uh, published in journal of children orthopedic, they also found that the femoral head size and not the osophic nucleus is negatively correlated to the risk of a vascular necrosis. So the larger the femoral head, the smaller the risk of a vascular necrosis. Okay, sir. Okay, how to, uh, to decrease the incidence of vascular necrosis? At first, avoid extreme position in hip spike. Don't do a hip abduction more than 50 degree. Next, enduring, op uh, enduring operative uh, op reduction. If the femoral head is high and it is reduced under pressure, we should do femoral shortening to decrease the pressure on the head. Also, it's important to do adequate muscle release and concentric reduction. Next, sir. In a, in a research published in the Journal of Children Orthopedic, the author finds the degree of hip abduction in the hip spike appears to be an important risk factor for patients less than six months. And they, uh, they recommend limited abduction to less than 50 degree. Okay. Okay, in another, uh, back please, sir. In another research review of lecture, they also recommend avoiding wide abduction and use of femoral shorting can decrease much the uh, incidence of avascular necrosis while treating DDH. Okay, sir. so how to treat uh, avascular necrosis? As our professor said before, we, we can do uh, femoral head transplantation if the head is completely resolved. But if I have overriding ureter to counter, we can do trochanteric with disease or trochanteric advancement. In case 
of Fox Savara, we can do lateral closing wedge, vargas osteotomy, which may be combined with trochanteric epiphysis. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, I think Professor Tare uh, has a comment in his hand. You want to, to told us something, Tare? Uh, yes, I, I have. Uh... I have two, two, two comments. The first one is regarding this uh, patient that we showed the x-ray of. It is very important uh, before making the final judgment is to make an MRI. Because actually this particular patient that I have showed on the x-ray, uh, she has complete absence of the ossific of the head on the plain x-ray. But when we did an MRI on her, she has a, 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 a well-developed head that is totally cartilaginous. So this is very strange. And one of the signs is that failure of the ossific center to grow. And sometimes it's complete disappearance. But when you do an MRI, you find it. And this means that the hip is still stable. And which means that even with time, if you get limb length discrepancy, it will not be very dramatic. And even if it reaches maybe more than five centimeters, you can do a limb lengthening with a unilateral frame without fear of proximal migration or subluxation. The other comment I wanted to make was regarding the paper that Dr. Shady presented about that open reduction has an increased risk of uh, AVN when compared to closed reduction on the age of three. I'm not particularly sure uh, whether this study was looking at the classic uh, um, uh, bikini incision uh, anterior approach of the hip, or it was including patients with the medial approach, because it is well known that the medial uh, approach has a very, not very, but has a much higher incidence of AVN when compared to the open, uh, to the open reduction through the anterior uh, approach. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tari. Uh, now we shift to another scenario with uh, a girl 16 months old, and she went under open reduction for right developmental dysplasia of the hip. And during intraoperative evaluation, there was, there was concentric reduction achieved perfectly, and it, this was confirmed by an image intensifier. And immediate post-operative, after discharging from the theater, she a plain X-ray revealed dislocated hip. So, the, in, simple, in short, the subluxation of dislocation immediate post-operative. How can how would you proceed, Professor Ali Ibrahim, for that? I think uh, the problem in this case may have happened because of uh, some points which uh, Professor Tarek mentioned before. Maybe the transverse ligament was not uh, excised or cut. Maybe uh, the acetabulum was not properly cleaned. Uh, we have to exclude that the hip is dislocated during application of the spiker. This should not happen actually. Uh, and the concentric reduction during surgery should be very easy. It should not be done under force to avoid such a complication. Uh, in that case, if this is uh, seen immediately after uh, the surgery, we have to change the cast under general anesthesia, and again, uh, image intensifier should be used to be sure it is a concentric reduction. So Some you said uh, we have... Hmm. Yes, yes. Continue, sir. Some authors may uh, go on for open re-reduction and uh, to avoid uh, missing uh, uh, instability arising uh, factors there, like transverse ligament or uh, ibusoas tendon or uh, bulbinar uh, acetabular. Assuming, no, assuming that, that, Professor Ali, you are yeah. the surgeon who did yeah. And you do all the, remove all the obstacles for concentric reduction. And I have. And you will, and, okay. I have to and change you, the you, cast. Yeah. I have to change, change the, the cast analysis. under general analysis. Yes. Okay. Do you, do you uh, put in mind or think that 
may be a supplementary K wire fixation to restore the head. We can size lose this. Yes, yes, we can do this. We can do this. Okay, Professor Hani. Yeah. Uh, Professor Hani, I think you have another opinion, and uh, you should tell us why that take place. Took place. I think if the hip was reduced nicely during surgery, <clears throat> most probably the problem is during lifting the child to be uh, put in the spike. And this can be really important to look after. Uh, you have to lift the baby. One uh, can lift the head and the spine and the back, and another one should lift the, the trunk and one on each leg. So you get a proper uh, movement for the child uh, to be put in, in a spike. Uh, provided that the surgery was done and it was really concentrically reduced. What were the next uh, line treatment? What do you do next? She's now sublaxed or dislocated. Uh, I would put her on, uh, I, I would change the plaster on GA. Okay, like Professor Alice. This one of one of questions sent to us tonight from one of our colleagues about what what we will do after subluxation. I think this answer now reached to him. Tarek, do you have any other opinion, Tarek, that you will go to uh, close the reduction, change of spike like Professor Alan Turani, or you proceed for reopen reduction and doing something else? No, I believe that this immediate post we have to differentiate in in, in recurrent cases between immediate or early and late each one has each one of them has its causes so this is an immediate dislocation please uh, please uh, please, uh, please please uh, on this case because we have the delayed one next one yeah yeah i believe that in this one which is the uh, immediate dislocation redislocation like professor haney says i am nearly almost 100 percent sure that it is caused during lifting the baby and applying the spike uh, so this actually should have been detected immediately because what we do is that after at least four people should attend the application of the hip spike. I always okay. believe that there are three very important steps during the open reduction. One of them is the cutting the transverse acetabular ligament because sometimes you have to do it blindly. The second is during the capsulography because you have to get your flaps right. And the third is application of the cost. So you just can't go away and leave uh, your um, assistants to apply the cost. We need four people to be present during application of the hip spica. And after we finish the hip spica, we should get an AP and the lateral view in the hip spica. And it's very easy now. We, we are trained to do the lateral view in the hip spica by putting the baby on the operated side and maybe uh, tilting the baby just a few degrees to get the other leg out of the way because we usually do one and a half spiker. And you need to get that nice view when you see the ischium on its uh, dead lateral border and you see the acetabulum and you see the head pointing towards the triradiate cartilage. It's only then that I am happy and I go and drink my coffee. So the okay. answer to this question is to do an immediate close reduction and to answer your argument about using a K wire, I totally disagree because the wire is not any good for stability. If you, ha if you have any obstacles for reduction and you depend on the wire, you will end up maybe a few days later with the hip again dislocated with the wire in. So we have to depend really on the concentric reduction and uh, applying the spike in the correct position. Okay, and uh, we shift from your last word that we have another uh, delayed subluxation or dislocation after everything is okay. The girl is two years and she was operated and then operatively she has concentric reduction is achieved and the immediate post-operative CT scan even done. And we ha she had concentric reduction of her head, but follow-up CT after two weeks revealed dislocated hip. How can we proceed for that Professor in the first case? We decide to do the change of cost under anesthesia. Now she is two weeks later or later post operative. How could you manage this? Sorry, who are you asking, Professor Nabil? Professor Hani. Yes. Professor Hani. Yes. Uh, you you heard me about two weeks, this case? Two weeks post operative. And it was weeks, well, yes. 
very yes. well reduced. I think yes. it's a rota rotation problem. Yes. I don't think this was a reduced nicely from the beginning. It slipped. Slipped means that either the posterior part of the establum is deficiently markedly, which is not the common, but the common thing is that it, it was put in, in not a very well reduced position. So these are the causes. What yeah. is the next step? You return the girl back to the operating theater and do something there? Yes, I would, I would uh, re redo the operation and make sure that it, the rotation of the limb is okay and the reduction is reasonable. Stay. Okay. okay. From the x-ray, Professor Tare, I, 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 I see that the, the surgeon did not do any short of the femur. Could be this a cause of this uh, recurrence of subluxation because an X-ray is available in front of you and there is no shortening or uh, any form of osteotomy. Could be this is the reason for that? Is it neglected to do femoral shortening? Uh, no, my opinion, first of all, if we look at the immediate post-operative lateral view and the immediate post-operative CT scan, CT scan. it very, is very well reduced. It is concentrically reduced. I believe that the reason that this hip dislocated two weeks later is an error in the steps of the operation. So maybe the transver going back to what we said before, maybe the surgeon didn't divide the transverse acetabular ligament. Maybe he didn't clear the acetabulum of all the pulvinar inside. Maybe the capsulography was not done correctly. Maybe the uh, the flap. You, you know, are the surgeon, Tari. Tari, you are a surgeon, and you did all of that. How can we treat this case? <laughs> I'm and even though I'm confident that I do all the steps every time, you at one time you might you might have a mistake. You might uh, yes, of course. I will go. I will go back in and I will mm -hmm. do an open reduction again. Well, yes. what about the capsule and the vascularity of the femoral head at second exposure of it? No, 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 no risk at all. I will not use any force. All I will do is that I will simply go in. The planes, I will just open the planes and then I will remove the stitch of my capsulography and then I will have a, have a second look inside the establum. If there are any obstacles, I will remove them. Uh, if there is any a part of the transverse establular ligament still not divided, I will divide it. And then I will redo my capsule with heavy sutures. And then uh, this is the only, the only time when I might be tempted to uh, protect myself with a wire. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, now we shift to, to Dr. Shadi, who will tell us what we need to know to avoid this complication, either subluxation or dislocation, either as an important complication of that. Hey, Shadi. Thank you, Professor Nabi. Uh, we all know that recurrent subluxation or dislocation may be caused by inadequate reduction from the start or our failure to maintain concentric reduction. Okay. Uh, most, uh, the instance of occurrence is 3% if the operation is done through anterior approach and up to 14% if, if done through medial approach. Okay. Okay, sir. As you can uh, suggest that uh, risk factor uh, for failure after open reduction VDH can be summarized in maybe due to the uh, appearance of VDH on the right side or in bilateral cases or greater pelvic widths or decreased hip abduction in hip spica and increased femoral antiversion. Okay, sir. Other risk factor that uh, may affect the uh, dislocation is inadequate soft tissue release, as Professor Tariq said. And in case of, uh, which increase the incidence of redislocation, if we did not uh, under, uh, did uh, intra-articular release, especially for transverse uh, subaltern, uh, for ligamentum uh, teres and transverse ligament. Next, sir. Okay. Okay. In a paper published in the English Journal of Orthopedic, the author uh, stressed that the experience of the surgeon and the technical factor play a very important role in preventing early dislocation. 
and they found that the absent oesophic center, and they found that the absent oesophic center was uh, has a higher incidence of redislocation, but it was not statistically significant. Okay. In another paper published in the uh, Inter International Journal, uh, the author found that high total is uh, that high total intervention of the femoral head and the stabulum is the main cause of redislocation. Also, he found that there is no significant difference in terms of a stable incl inclination angle, ossific nucleus uh, diameter, and pelvic side, or pelvic width, or center edge angle, or a stable volume. They, in, uh, they recommend correction of increased uh, femoral antiver uh, of antiversion by femoral osteotomy in association with pelvic osteotomy to increase stability of the uh, joint. Okay, sir. Okay, some surgeons prefer to uh, classify the reason for fear of overproduction into immediate causes like dislocation during application of risk factor or associated pelvic osteotomy or femoral osteotomy with upper reduction. Some surgeons prefer to postpone the femoral osteotomy or pelvic osteotomy to another uh, operation after six weeks. Okay. Okay. Also, the, uh, the, the reason for delay failure may be in adequate soft tissue is poor or inappropriate capsulography. Okay. Okay. The first question we have to answer, when to do revision operation? If the redislocation is uh, discovered early within the first four weeks, immediate intervention can be done. But if redislocation is discovered after uh, more than six weeks, it is better to wait to give a patient a period uh, of freedom from the hip spiker to, uh, to, uh, to for the mobility to return, and then we can do uh, revision surgery after six week promotion. Okay. Okay. The first thing to do is to maintain a constant reduction during the operation. We cannot do pelvic or femoral osteotomy without the, the hip placed well inside the establishment. Unless this is done, we will not, cannot maintain reduction. What to do inside the operation? As we did in the, uh, as open reduction normally, we release interarticular structure, especially transverse stable ligament, ligament anterior, and we remove the pelvinar. And if the stable labrum is inverted, we can do radial cuts in it to avert it. If it's still, if the hip is still high, we can do femoral shortening to reduce the hip without any pressure on it inside the stable. Some also prefer to do femoral antiversion in the next operation, in another operation after about six weeks, but other surgeons prefer to do it in the same setting if it, it is required intraoperative. Okay. Of course, capsulography is an important step to be performed with heavy sutures. And if the hip is still unstable, we can uh, place a QIRs to just maintain constant reduction. Of course, the patient is mobilized in the hip spiker for about 12 weeks. Okay. Thank you, Shadi. Sure. Uh, Thank you. I, I, I want to ask uh, Dr. Tamer Fayad about his uh, personal working on the patient uh, with the recurrent uh, case after six weeks. What you can face during reduction or we, during manipulation of the bone after uh, recurrence, after doing an operation six weeks, you will decide to do an open reduction and femoral working. What about okay. the quality of bone you may okay, face sir. during the operation? Uh, uh, okay, sir, this, this problem I, I have faced uh, many times. Uh, when doing a stage uh, operation for DDH, uh, starting with open reduction and femoral osteotomy six weeks later, uh, what I have found that the, the, the bone quality is very weak. Sometimes uh, I cannot hold the, the, the osteotomy by the plate. So I, uh, from my personal experience, I stopped doing a virus dilatation six weeks later. I do it at the same session uh, with open reduction. Okay, but what about if the case after complete reduction, it is dislocated? 
uh, you will how long time you will leave her to redo the operation what how, how long maybe maybe i week uh, i will i will wait for a few months to uh, give the child a chance to start walking and start regaining some uh, muscle activity then uh, do the uh, the operation again okay sometimes you may do an over uh, closure of the capsule and the capsule may be very very tight during uh, closure during capsulotherapy and may, may dis subluxate or dislocate the head posteriorly. Do you advise to remove part of the capsule, like we said now, capsulectomy, capsulectomy, and they do capsulography not too tight during the operation? Okay, sir. To uh, avoid that? Uh, I don't close the, the capsule very tight, especially when I'm doing uh, some sort of femoral surgery at, at the same session. Because yes. if, uh, if I did... Uh, a tight capsulography and femoral osteotomy will likely uh, be dislocated posteriorly. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, my colleagues. Uh, now we should, the last uh, part of our webinar tonight is the late presenting cases. And we start to present a six-year-old girl with left developmental dysplasia of the hip presented to your clinic and the parents admitted uh, that apart from limping, the child with no pain and has no disability. And this x-ray done for her by you. Uh, please, Professor Haney, can you tell me uh, how can you proceed for treatment of such girl? Uh, thank you for asking me, Dr. Nabil. And uh, now this is a dislocated hip in a six-year-old. Yes. Fine. I mean, this is not a very high dislocation. Can be reduced nicely. An open reduction will be fine. But we have really to understand that reducing the hip should be done without pressure and without extreme uh, 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 angles, flexion, severe abduction, severe internal rotation. We have to get this as right. So the hip should be reduced and rotation should be uh, stabilized properly as well as a proper capsulography. That would be enough in such a case. Mind you, I want to, to, to stress this again because there's a lot of studies going on now with the closed reduction in such cases. Uh, this was done by uh, the... the, the uh, 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 Papelio, uh, Nicholas Papelio in uh, Greece, and this was uh, done for 10 years now with a good results. He uses a modified Hoffman Daimler technique. In our experience, I would do an open reduction if needed, if needed, a femoral shortening. But I don't think this will need okay. a thermal But this should be assessed during surgery. Do you, uh, first of all, we, we, we agree that we may, we may need, if we decide to do open reduction, femoral shortening. Do you uh, advise to do uh, all the steps or the cor con to obtain concentric reduction yes. at yes, once or staged? Do, yes, yes, I would do all together. I all would together go out, in this case. This is well reduced and stabilized. I wouldn't wait for another session. I would go okay. straight away, do everything at the same session, go outside and everything is settled. For the same case, please. Do you agree with that or do you have another opinion? Sorry? Professor Ali. Yes, uh, I actually agree with uh, Professor Hani. This is not very high dislocation. It can be reduced by open reduction. We may need to do uh, derotation varus osteotomy. And in some cases, especially this case, I think there is dysplasia of the establum. So we may need to, to do a setup establum or pelvic osteotomy. We can uh, delay it after six weeks. Yes, but you know from this figure, Professor Ali, that the girl is walking without pain 
limbing only and there's no disability uh, because it is uh, unilateral it should be treated yes that's my what I, I want to know yeah got it do you agree that you, you will proceed for all the steps in the same set or you do stage the operation for the girl first of all uh, whenever i get a ddh in, in, in a child who is older than four years old, I am very, very concerned about the outcome. And I spend a lot of time with the parents explain, explaining to them that I am, cannot guarantee the outcome. Because we all have to remember that whether you have a unilateral or bilateral high or low uni, uh, dislocation that is neglected after the age of four, and the older the child is, the more relevant my, uh, my points are, is that you might get a very good uh, result on the x-ray, which is detected by the what we call the Severin classification, but you might end up by a very not good or very not satisfactory clinical outcome, as we know by the uh, Mac Mac McAfee or the McRae clinical classification. Which, I mean, you might get a, 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 re a reduced tip on the x-ray, but it's stiff clinically, so the child is suffering. So I'm very reluctant. But definitely unilateral, six years old. I also take, take, in, take into consideration the baby's weight. So if the baby's weight is in of the average weight and it's unilateral and it's not very high, then I'm definitely not going to hesitate to operate after explaining to the parents the possible outcome of stiffness. And then, but I would agree with Professor, uh, Professor uh, Ali Ibrahim and Professor Hany Hefni that we are going to need open reduction. We will not need femoral shortening. We will need a derotation osteotomy with, that, with very minimal or no virus. But I believe in staged procedures. I will do an open reduction. And then six weeks later, I will do my derotation osteotomy. The reason for this is that there is a lot of evidence from the literature and also from my personal experience that if you do combined open reduction with a, with a femoral osteotomy, what you end up with is jeopardizing your capsulography because you end up with the proximal femur with, uh, as a loose piece of bone and you cannot stabilize your uh, joint. So I do the capsulography and then six weeks later I go in and do my varus osteotomy and the point that Dr. Tamer mentioned about the bone being osteopenic is very relevant in young children and in paralytic dislocations. That's why I've stopped doing any femoral procedures under the age of three. But in a six-year-old, if, if you do an open reduction and put her in the hip spiker for six weeks, then you will not have any problem of osteopenia, provided she's not uh, paralytic and she's not young. Okay, that's what happened. It's what was done for the girl. She underwent stage open reduction. Then six weeks later, she was uh, operated by VDO with minimal virus osteotomy to contain. And here, uh, again, it's the uh, rule. There is a key wire put in the hip to maintain the reduction. I don't know why. Next, she had an excellent clinical and the radiological outcome. This is an X-ray for the girl, as you see. And she is, now she, this is a clinical put over with very good range of abduction. No limb lens discrepancy as you see, and she is here walking after the operation. Okay. Next scenario, we, we are uh, another case but with the same problem with the left hip dislocation and she is six years old and this x-ray showing that the hip dislocation is very high. Is there any other uh, rationale or procedure you may ask her to do, Professor Haney? You said that the first one is not highly dislocated and we can do open reduction with or without femoral shortening. But this one, I, the plan of treatment will be different because it is high. Your opinion, Professor Henny? Well, it's uh, as you said, it's high. So femoral shortening is definitely needed. There's no doubt about this. But I would like to assess the establishment a little bit more. Yes. 
because it might need a, a pelvic osteotomy of somewhere. Uh, so I would go all, I, I don't believe in staged uh, surgery. I would go and do everything. All in one, time. all yes. in one. If one you, surgery, you, yes. use the hip, shorting, get the rotation right. If you have a problem with the cover, you cover the, with the head, you cover it with the pelvic osteotomy, do a proper capsulography. And if you're trained to do this, you have no problem doing the capsulography after the reduction. There's no problem at all. Yes, sir. So I, I shift to Tamer because I want to ask you one very important question. Uh, you, dis, you do an open reduction and the head is contained. Uh, how can you determine the need for femoral or pelvic osteotomy intraoperative? You decide to do a reduction, you did it, but the head should be contained perfectly. You answer, okay. you, you hear me? How okay. can you decide which of osteotomy we need, femoral or pelvic or no need at all? Okay, so we, we, have, we have what we call the test of stability. Uh, meaning that yes. uh, uh, which position the head is stable in. If it is stable in, uh, in neutral rotation and uh, and full extension, so we don't need any uh, any additional osteotomy. But if it is uh, contained in internal rotation and abduction, so we need a VDO. If it is unstable in uh, extension and it uh, tries to subluxate anterior, mostly we will do uh, an additional pelvic osteotomy. Okay, thank you, Tim. Okay, she underwent open reduction, femoral shortening, and six weeks later, staged one, she underwent VDO, and this is the opinion of the surgeon, but Professor Haney told that, us that he can do all in one according to his experience. This is the immediate X-ray post. She had an excellent clinical and radiology, as we see. Okay, another very important clinical scenario, we discussed the unilateral hip dislocation connected our, at older age with unilateral side and limping without pain and disability and unilateral case. What about the cases presented at age above six years and presented with bilateral neglected DDH? And the parents are always concerned about the diagnosis and the future future implications of the girl. If, if uh, and they ask if we can leave her or operate her. And this, for example, the presentation of our girl. You see, you can see she has a waddling gait, she has wide perineum, limping, painless with excessive lumbar lordosis. Okay. And this is the photo clinical and radiological of the girl. The concern now is the case is neglected. She is six years, seven years old, and she has bilateral equivocal DDH on both sides. What we can do, Professor Ali? Well, uh, I will go for stage surgery. You uh, to one side and the stage is surgery for the, uh, the other side, but I have to stress to very well clarify the prognosis and the expected problems to the parents. And I believe the choice to them. If they decide so you... to operate, hmm. if they decide to operate, we will do stage it left side, then stage it right side, the long time for uh, treatment, the guarded prognosis and outcome. And the other thing, uh, the asymmetrical results on one side from the other side. Sometimes one side is uh, having a very well very well reduction and uh, 
uh, growth and uh, asymptomatic, but the other side will show some problems. Then the so child you, will start, yeah. And so you decide, the first way is to decide to do or not to do. You decide to do and you will start to, uh, to decide do. to do staged surgery, yes. one side by one side. One, one by according. one. Okay. Yes, okay. but, okay. You, but it should Haney. be very clear to the parents yes. about the prognosis of the case. Professor Henny, you agree that or you have a, uh, to, I, you decide I, I to agree. leave the girl till maturity? No, I wouldn't leave the girl. I yes. would do the open reduction and whatever is necessary, femoral shortening, pelvic osteotomy, capsulography, get the hip reduced, spica, and the other one is next. Yes, I would sir. leave sometimes before the two uh, uh, surgeries, after the, uh, if we're going to start with the right side, after we finish mm -hmm. the right side, get the full movements from the right side to the other side, left side. But if, if, if you, uh, another one decide to leave the girl without any intention, what is the prognosis for her? What is the problem later on? Well, this, uh, the, the, this problem uh, that this girl, maybe, we don't know when, maybe when she's uh, 18, 19, 20, maybe when she's 30, we don't, we don't really know when she might start to have some problems. Interestingly, she will not start to complain of her hips. She will start to complain of her back first because of the increased stresses on the back, particularly in unilateral cases, but even also in bilateral cases. Um, so it's, it's a really very tricky uh, situation to make up your mind. And this is one, uh, this is one of the very, very few uh, situations where I, I am not able to give my answer to the parents, should we have do the operation or not? And like Professor Ali said, we should explain to them and give them the, the, um, the opportunity to share in the decision making. I know it's not fair sometimes because they want you to get to tell them what to do. But unfortunately, we do not, we don't, we do not have enough evidence in the literature, literature in the, of, uh, of the outcome. Um, but if the parents say, okay, we want to take the risk uh, or take the chance, then I will go in and I will do it. And I will do it in a staged procedure. And I will do the, the open reduction and, if, and the femoral shortening in one stage. And then go in six weeks later, do the video, and then leave the baby out of the cast for at least six weeks to get the hips mobilized and the osteopenia over. And then go in and attack the, the other side, the same side. And you're really concerned about the possibility of asymmetric results sometimes. Okay. Uh, Tamer, uh, do, you, uh, do you tell In me... In brief, uh, Dr. Nabil, uh, time, time, no, sorry. Time, uh, the last, uh, we last session, Professor Amr. Uh, yes. Tamer, uh, you decide to do both sides. Do you agree with uh, uh, our senior professor that you do uh, every, each side uh, at the same time or staged? No, I prefer, sir, to do it uh, at the same time. Okay, but we actually... May I add something, Dr. Nabil? Yes, of course. Yeah. As Professor Tari said, and Professor Ali said, that we have to explain everything. Uh, yes. We have to tell them that at some stage, if she's not happy with this result, there is another operation can get her walking at the age of puberty, which is... Our, or whenever she has pain, which is a pelvic support osteotomy, and this should be clarified from day one. So everything should be clarified to the parents before surgery. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And I, I will ex show the figures of the girl now, rapidly, because uh, we pass time. This is the girl before the operation. Le the, uh, the the results of that uh, I know, about, results at, uh, bad I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Bad, okay. bad one side was okay done. okay okay never mind uh, the last clinical scenario tonight is the same problem and uh, I will uh, passing rapidly on the photo of the girl with bilateral DDH as we see and this is the clinical and radiological uh, uh, data before the surgery and this 
Gates. Decide to do what we what are all agreed about the line Z stage treatment for, and then this is before the, 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 this is one side done and the other side prepared to be operated as time of the operation. This is the result of the left side. Yes, yes, she was operated the left and waiting for the right, right, Okay. Yes. Now she's, she's yeah prepared for doing the left, right side. X, yeah, exactly. And this is the X-ray post-operative for both sides. CT scan. Okay, now last talk presented with our colleagues Tamer about how what we need to know about these cases presented late after six years. Yes, Tamer, please. Okay, sir. Uh, okay, we are faced with, uh, with a great problem this age of above six years. Uh, we have a certain debate whether to interfere with these cases or leave it alone, do it at one stage or a stage surgery. Uh, the problem with these cases is that it is a long standing case, meaning that we have already uh, some sort of changes in the, 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 uh, the anatomy and the osteology and on the soft tissue. Uh, usually these uh, cases has a very large head, a very small and shallow astablum, uh, some sort of muscle weakness or, or muscle dysfunction. Next, sir, please. So it is, if it is left untreated, we are uh, faced with a limping child or a limping uh, adolescent. Uh, and it will lead to a progressive disability that will uh, leave the patient uh, crippled uh, early in life. The aim of the treatment here is somehow different. We are not aiming at attaining a fully functioning uh, hip, our a fully normal hip. Uh, we are aiming after the reduction of the head is to regain some sort of normal anatomy to, to, to facilitate later management and uh, to, to some sort of improve the way of walking. We are faced with two situations, unilateral cases and bilateral cases. In unilateral, we have to interfere. Uh, but in bilateral cases, this is a great debate uh, because uh, Around the age, the age of six years, uh, we are faced with a long time to finish this patient. Uh, so we have, the patient has to understand the, the problem and what we are facing. Next, please, sir. Next, sir. The, the problem of stiffness is very great. So this is a, this is a state of art review article that stated that uh, between the age of three and eight years, we have the option of open reduction with or without femoral shortening and with or without pelvic osteotomy. And above eight years, we have two options. Either we do the, the same or neglect the patient. Next, sir. This is a, a literature review. A one stage uh, hip reconstruction is what I found mostly uh, the, the work done on, on the one stage reconstruction, including all the steps to be done at the same session. Uh, they pointed out a very, very uh, clear point that if we need shortening, we do adequate shortening. We don't depend on the degree of varization to present a part of shortening. Shortening is a part and varization is a part. Next, sir. Another paper uh, talking about the late diagnosed bilateral DDH, they told, they told us that the, 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 the results will be better on the first operated uh, hip. But there is a great concern in the bilateral cases that the, the outcome may not be the same. Next, sir. Surgery before the age of eight years in the unilateral cases and before five and a half years in the unilateral, in the bilateral cases, is the recommended uh, age of interference. 
However, the age and the unilaterality of bilaterality is not an absolute criterion for the decision making. It should be tailored according to each case. At the end, despite this substantial research, high quality comparative studies are lacking between the different types of treatment. And at the end, it is according to the experience of the treatment surgeon. Thank you, sir.